submarine. Mention of the word conjures a feeling of unease, a sense of secrecy and terror, and images that frighten. Enormous, strange vessels disappearing beneath the oceans of the world, unseen, hidden, cut off from the surface. Weapons, striking the vulnerable without regard, unexpectedly, swiftly. Imagine yourself on board and new sensations arise. Isolation, claustrophobia, tension. The air is stale, thick with the smell of men and machinery. There are no windows, only the captain's eye peering through the periscope. There is silence, the silence of the deep, and everywhere there is the sea, crowding in, pressing closer. In 1900, a strange new vessel appeared off the coast of Connecticut. It had two sources of power, gasoline engines for the surface and electric batteries for journeys underwater. While it was below the surface, the boat was navigated by compass. It couldn't spend much time underwater, but the remarkable ability to travel beneath the sea gave the vessel its name. It was called a submarine. The submarine was armed with four torpedoes. A single torpedo was capable of sinking almost any ship in the world. With its capacity for stealth and a lethal blow, the submarine got the attention of the world's navies. Over the course of the next 15 years, countries all over the world bought or built submarines. Britain, France, Germany, Russia, Italy, and the United States all added submarines to their fleets. They were sure they wanted a submarine, but were unsure how to use it. A role in defensive ports and occasional sabotage missions were contemplated. Combat with enemy fleets was not likely. For even when it operated on the surface, where it was much quicker, the submarine was too slow for combat with a warship. An average destroyer traveled 10 to 15 knots faster than the quickest submarine. When the First World War began in August of 1914, few imagined the submarine would figure in the conflict at all. German submarines, U-boats, changed that thinking. They did it by attacking ships that were slow, merchant ships. Frustrated by a British blockade of their ports, Germany started sinking the ships that supplied England. In three separate campaigns that shocked the world, German U-boats demonstrated the power of the submarine to cut supplies and halt industry. To combat the U-boats, Britain developed hydrophones for underwater listening and depth charges to cripple the boats below the surface. Neither were particularly effective. Much of the world felt Germany's U-boats had violated international law, but until the war was over, they could do little but suffer. Beginning with the Washington Naval Conference in 1921, diplomats and military leaders tried to limit the role of the submarine in war. In 1930, after long negotiations, an international agreement was signed which made it illegal for a submarine to sink a merchant ship without warning. To the world's leaders, it must have seemed for a moment that the terrible genie of the submarine was back in the bottle. They were wrong. Within 30 years, the submarine would be transformed from an outlawed vessel into the most dominant ship on the seas. Three men were responsible. This is their story. On the eve of the Second World War, the German Admiral Karl Dönitz tried to persuade Hitler that the submarine was not finished at all. With enough U-boats, he was sure he could cut Britain off from its supplies and starve it into surrender. He believed the submarine was a war-decisive weapon, an ultimate weapon. Hitler was not persuaded, but Dönitz was very nearly right. The only thing that ever really frightened me during the war was the U-boat peril. It did not take the form of flaring battles and glittering achievements. It manifested itself through statistics, diagrams, and curves unknown to the nation, incomprehensible to the public. The high and faithful spirit of the people counted for naught in this bleak domain. Either the food, supplies, and arms from the New World and from the British Empire arrived across the oceans, or they failed. By the time Winston Churchill wrote those lines in 1949, he had witnessed the defeat of the British Army in France and its evacuation at Dunkirk. He had lived through the Battle of Britain and the bombing of his people and cities. 
He had felt the force of the mighty German army and artillery. He had experienced the attack of the Luftwaffe and had been the first leader to suffer the modern terror of long-range rockets. He had seen the innocent working people of Britain bombed to death and the citizens of Coventry buried in a common grave. But when Churchill looked back on six horrible years of war, it was Germany's submarines which scared him. The story of the submarine's rise to power begins with the German U-boat. In the spring of 1940, the Nazis took Western Europe in their grip. They stormed through France, seized the Atlantic coast, and trained their sights on England. As Hitler reviewed troops in Paris, the German military massed itself against the English. With the fall of France, the chances that Churchill would get the food, supplies, and arms he needed shrank. The threat came not from the Nazis parading in Paris, but from U-boats along the coast. In May of 1940, the harbors of France hummed with Nazi activity. The German U-boat force, geographically bottled up in the Baltic, was free at last to attack Atlantic shipping from an open coast. Up and down the shores of France and Norway, ports were transformed into bases for a fleet to squeeze the life from England. Massive submarine pens sprang up in the harbors of Brest, La Rochelle, and Lorient. These virtually indestructible structures, walled with 12 feet of solid concrete, protected the U-boats from the pounding of Allied bombers. Within the safe haven of their walls, Germany's submarines prepared to bring England to her knees. Commanding the U-boats was Admiral Karl Dönitz. Dönitz was practical, cool, and ruthless. A veteran of the First World War, he understood the risks he expected his men to take. He was also a visionary who understood that effective submarine warfare required a break with the gentlemanly traditions of naval combat and, if need be, with international law. In November of 1939, he issued Standing Order 154. Rescue no one and take no one on board. Do not concern yourselves with the ship's lifeboats. Weather conditions and the proximity of land are of no account. Care only for your own boat and strive to achieve the next success as soon as possible. We must be hard in this war. And so in the early summer of 1940, Dernitz launched a heartless assault on merchant shipping that he hoped would break the back of England and win the war. The so-called happy time began for the U-boats. The prey they hunted were large Allied convoys. In the vast spaces of the Atlantic, a convoy reduced the odds that a U-boat would find merchant ships to pursue. It also allowed the Allies to concentrate their forces of protection. Destroyers escorted the merchant ships, and coastal aircraft covered them close to land. U-boats, like all submarines of the era, could only submerge for brief periods of time. They traveled mostly on the surface where they were susceptible to attack from the air. But the Allies could spare few aircraft and had meager destroyers in the early years. Once spotted, the convoys were vulnerable. When a convoy was spotted, the U-boat commander would radio its position back to headquarters in coastal France. There, the message was decoded and relayed directly to Dönitz. With the information from its commanders, Dernitz would personally direct other U-boats into the area and unleash them for the kill. A sophisticated mapping system kept communications brief and precise. This coordinated attack was the essence of his tactic, a tactic called Wolf Pack. the deadly wolf packs, the beleaguered allies suffered. In the first summer of operations from France, 274 British ships went down. Dernitz lost only two U-boats. The onslaught continued for almost two years. The U-boats seemed unstoppable. England was in danger of being cut off. 
After months at sea, the U-boat sailors returned to the ports of France, weary but exultant. Flags indicating tonnages of each ship sunk festooned the boats as they sailed into the safe haven of the concrete subpens. Aggressiveness was all for the U-boat captain, and a successful tour of good hunting guaranteed a hero's welcome. The U-boat crews enjoyed more than military honors. They received bonus pay for hazardous duty, and Dernitz personally ordered the establishment of luxury retreats where the men could recuperate. Dancing, drinking, and the company of a pretty French girl took the sting out of months in the steel confines of a U-boat. But the reality of a U-boat sailor's life was grim and as hard as the war Dernitz waged against the Allies. One toilet served the 40-man crew. Fresh water was so precious, men rarely showered or shaved during the weeks at sea. The few who made it to the deck and fresh air endured long watches in the foul weather of the North Atlantic. As one veteran said of the U-boat, the whole thing is nothing but a steel cigar crammed with machinery and weapons. Anything not of iron or steel looks totally out of place. By the spring of 1943, Dernitz had over a hundred U-boats at sea. But the Allies had improved their convoy defenses with more land-based aircraft. British intelligence had also cracked the German naval code. With intercepted radio transmissions, they could deduce the areas of U-boat operations. Once in the area, superior sonar enabled the Allies to locate the U-boats precisely after they'd gone underwater. Despite these advantages, the Allies were vulnerable. A gap still existed off the coast of Greenland where the Allies could not provide air defense. It was here, in the Greenland air gap, that the wolf packs hunted. On March 15, 1943, U-653 spotted a large convoy, and Dernitz ordered three packs of U-boats, Robber Baron, Attacker, and Harrier, to close from north and south and catch the convoy in their jaws. In reality, there were two Allied convoys, SC-112 and HX-229. British intelligence intercepted the U-boat radio transmissions, but the convoys were helpless in the Greenland air gap. What followed? was devastation. The largest battle of the Atlantic War cost the Allies 27 of the 90 merchant ships in convoys SC-112 and HX-229. 161,000 tons of cargo were lost. 373 seamen drowned or were killed by exposure in the cold March seas of the North Atlantic. Only one of the 42 U-boats involved was sunk in direct action. But one month later, the balance of power shifted dramatically. In April of 1943, small American escort carriers joined the convoys and provided continuous air cover across the Atlantic. Working with the destroyers, the aircraft directed depth charge attacks and hounded the U-boats from above. With no real defense against aircraft, the U-boats were forced to dive. Stuck beneath the surface with only limited battery power, the commander and his crew were open to attack by depth charge. The plunging cans of volatile explosive created a shock wave of water that could crush the hull of a U-boat and send it to the bottom. U-boat captains tried to evade the attacks by diving deep, but eventually they had to surface to recharge their batteries. Against continuous air cover, the U-boats had little hope. A persistent destroyer could inevitably crush the U-boat with a depth charge or drive it to the surface where its fate was certain destruction. spring of 1943, along with the escort carriers, longer-range B-24 bombers began patrols from coastal airstrips. 
The Liberators were radar equipped. This allowed them to pinpoint U-boats on the surface from miles away in any weather, day or night. Once they detected a U-boat, they would speed towards the target and pounce upon it before it could dive to safety. Surprised and unable to escape, the trapped wolves of Dernitz's fleet had little chance for life. By the end of May 1943, the windfall of new Allied weapons had ruined the U-boats. Dernitz called off the battle in the Atlantic. Losses, even heavy losses, must be borne when they are accompanied by corresponding sinkings, he said. Losses in May have reached an intolerable level. England would survive. The food, supplies, and arms she needed would reach her. Dernitz fought to the end hounding shipping where it was to his advantage and striving for improvements against attack from the air. Periodically, he inflicted heavy losses upon the Allies, but the consequence of Dernitz's hard war was most bitter to his own service. By war's end, 40,900 young German men had served on U-boat crews. 28,000 of those men went down with their boats, among them Dernitz's two sons. That casualty rate of over 70% was the highest of any branch of any service in any country throughout the Second World War. Before his suicide, Hitler named Karl Dönitz to succeed him as head of the Third Reich. At war's end, Dönitz stood trial at Nuremberg with the other surviving leaders of the German government and military. It was at Nuremberg that Dönitz would receive a final, peculiar vindication. Unrestricted submarine warfare, which Dönitz had waged so effectively, was outlawed under the international agreement signed before the war. This violation was the basis for one of the principal charges against him. In defense against this charge, Dönitz turned surprisingly to the United States Navy and its commander in the Pacific, Admiral Chester Nimitz. In a letter to the court, Nimitz acknowledged that from the beginning of the war with Japan, the United States submarine force had followed Dernitz's lead and exercised unrestricted warfare. It had attacked merchantmen without warning and had not rescued enemy survivors. In effect, Dernitz had taught the world how to fight a submarine war. Of those convicted at Nuremberg, Dernitz received the lightest sentence of all, 10 years. The relative lightness of the sentence has been interpreted many ways. The most ironic explanation is that Dönitz's strategy of attacks on merchant shipping was so effectively used by the Americans against the Japanese that it wouldn't have been just to condemn this visionary for showing American submarines the way to victory in the Pacific. In the United States, the Second World War ended with a burst of unbridled hope. Japan and Germany had been defeated. World peace was at hand. America had no more enemies. The American submarine service basked in this sunlight of victory. Where Dönitz had failed, they had succeeded. American submarines had destroyed two-thirds of Japanese shipping and brought its industry to a halt. Sailors returned home with a sense of invulnerability. They were the victors, and America alone possessed the most deadly weapon on Earth, the atomic bomb. The natural power of the universe is harnessed in the new atomic bomb, the mightiest, most destructive bombs yet produced, such as England's terrifying Grand Slam, weighing 11 tons, are puny midgets compared with the new atomic wonder.
But American confidence was soon shaken by the actions of its wartime ally, the Soviet Union. Bordering Russia were a number of countries which had been overrun during the war. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, Albania, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Poland. In meetings at Yalta and Potsdam... The stable post-World War envisioned by Churchill and Roosevelt disintegrated as Stalin seized political control of Eastern Europe. A series of sensational Soviet spy cases roused suspicions in the United States. And gradually, the specter of world communism, of freedom crushed by violence, filled Americans with fear. Frightening, isn't it? From all appearances, this community could be in Iowa, California, or Tennessee. But appearances are deceptive. This is not an American town. It isn't even in the United States. You might call this a college town, communist style. As part of a long-range plan to destroy our free way of life, these young communists are studying the economic, political, and religious institutions that are the very heartbeat of America. They're studying you. The atomic bomb would defend Americans from the communist threat, but only if it could be delivered to the Soviet Union. National controversy erupted over the best way to deliver the bomb. The smoldering feud between the Navy and Air Force burst into the open before... The Navy and Air Force, fighting for limited congressional funds, each proposed programs for an ultimate weapon. The Navy argued for a fleet of mobile supercarriers loaded with bombers that could deliver atomic weapons from the seas. The Air Force proposed squadrons of a long-range land-based bomber, the B-36, which could reach the Soviet Union from airfields in the United States. In the end, the B-36 won. Remarkably, the submarine, conqueror of 60% of Japan's fleet and Dernitz's ultimate weapon, did not even figure in the debate. In 1947, the American Submarine Officers Conference declared its own fleet-type submarines obsolete. The combination of diesel and battery-operated motors forced commanders to operate mostly on the surface. As long as the submarine's underwater operations were limited, it was vulnerable to the same combination of aircraft, radar, and surface vessels that had destroyed the U-boats. The American submarine's future looked as bleak as the mothballed vessels that filled the country's shipyards. It was from a post in the San Francisco shipyard, where he was in charge of mothballing, that a Navy captain came who would rescue the American submarine from obsolescence and move it to the front ranks of the world's military vessels. Hyman George Rickover was an unlikely figure to revolutionize the submarine world. Rickover had graduated from Annapolis in 1922, but had never been in combat. Though he'd served on submarines for three years in the 30s, he'd devoted most of his naval career to the problems of engineering. Smart, uncompromising, and tough, Rickover had a reputation for being difficult, but for getting things done. When he left San Francisco for his new assignment at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, the Navy hoped he might find some applications for the new field of nuclear physics. Instead, he was possessed by a revolutionary vision. Submarines powered not by diesel fuel, but by the energy of split atoms. If you wanted to learn about atomic energy after the war, Oak Ridge, Tennessee was where you went. The atmosphere was heady. Many of Rickover's teachers were fresh from the Manhattan Project, and he was eager to learn all he could. Rickover is said to have presented himself to Edward Teller, later the father of the hydrogen bomb, by saying, I am Captain Rickover. I am stupid. His candor didn't hurt him. Teller later remarked that Rickover was one of the few students there who actually put his education to use. At Oak Ridge, there was already a group that saw that the energy released in a nuclear reaction could be used to power submarines as well as bombs. A nuclear reaction required no oxygen, so a submarine could theoretically operate on nuclear power without ever having to surface. By the time he left, Rickover had taken charge of the group and had a plan. The idea was fundamentally simple. This is a simplified schematic drawing of a nuclear propulsion plant. This is the reactor and this the steam propulsion machinery. 
The reactor, encased in heavy shielding, contains fuel elements of highly enriched uranium. Control rods of neutron absorbing material control the activity of the reactor as they are inserted or withdrawn. As controlled fissioning or splitting of uranium atoms occurs in the reactor, tremendous heat results. This heat is carried to a steam generator by highly pressurized water. Here, the heat is transferred to less highly pressurized water, which is converted into steam to drive the ship's propulsion turbine and turbine generator sets. The turbine generator sets provide all the electricity required aboard the ship. This is While the idea of a nuclear-powered submarine was fundamentally simple, realizing it was an extraordinary task. The extreme heat generated by nuclear reactions and the risks of nuclear radiation in a small enclosed submarine required safety and precision of an unprecedented nature. New materials and structures had to be designed before the idea could even be tested. In 1949, Rickover won approval to build a prototype reactor in the desert town of Arco, Idaho. To simulate operating conditions, he constructed a full-scale submarine to house the reactor. Testing was expected to begin within a few years. But on September 23, 1949, the Soviet Union exploded their first atomic bomb. For the first time, Americans confronted the possibility of nuclear war. An arms race took off as the United States hurried to develop and build weapons ahead of the Russians. Against this backdrop of urgency, Rickover and his dream of a nuclear-powered submarine shine brightly. The idea of a submarine that could cruise undetected beneath the waves operating on atomic energy suited the futuristic paranoia of the Cold War. Government support increased, plans for the submarine itself were drawn up, and a construction contract was awarded to the electric boat company in Groton, Connecticut. Rickover and his submarine became a showpiece of American superiority. The project went into high gear. On June 14, 1952, President Truman laid and signed the keel of what was to be the first nuclear-powered vessel in the world, the submarine Nautilus. But one month later, Rickover suffered an enormous personal setback. The Navy Board of Selection passed him over a second time for promotion. Under Navy rules, he would be forced to retire within a year, long before the Nautilus was completed. It seemed that Rickover would be out of the Navy before his dream was realized. The board's confidential decision was clouded by reports of anti-Semitism and personal dislike of Rickover. While Rickover supporters looked for a way to save him, work on the Nautilus and her reactor continued. In Idaho, the prototype reactor was prepared for its inaugural test in March of the coming year. For the first time, nuclear energy would turn the turbines of a motor. Every effort had been made for this reactor to simulate the one that would power Nautilus. If it worked, the future of the nuclear submarine program was bright. If it failed, the program would be set back for years. On March 30, 1953, seven years after Rickover headed to Oak Ridge, the reactor came to life and worked perfectly. Two months later, after much persuasion by Senator Henry Jackson, Secretary of the Navy Anderson, and many others, the Navy Selection Board promoted Rickover to Rear Admiral. A position had been created for a captain experienced in the field of atomic propulsion for ships. There was only one man for the job. In the next two years, Rickover's hard, careful labor bore fruit. On January 14, 1954, the Nautilus was christened by Mrs. Eisenhower and surged toward her new home in the sea. One year later, its reactors fully operational, the Nautilus went to sea under nuclear power.
Hyman Rickover had become the father of the nuclear navy. On her shakedown cruise, the Nautilus traveled 1,381 miles submerged in 90 hours. The trip from New London, Connecticut to San Juan, Puerto Rico was the longest submerged journey for both time and distance ever made by a submarine. The cruise was also the fastest passage ever made by any vessel between New London and San Juan. Nautilus's first commander, Eugene Wilkinson, was so elated by the craft's performance, he wrote Rickover, the results of the tests so far conducted definitely indicate that a complete re-evaluation of submarine and anti-submarine strategy will be required. Its ultimate impact on Navy warfare should not be underestimated. The week the Nautilus was christened, Admiral Rickover appeared on the cover of Time magazine. It signified a rise to public prominence he would hold for nearly 30 years until his retirement in the early 1980s. By producing the first true submarine, Rickover gave the United States a vessel whose essential qualities of stealth and speed made it a terrifying weapon. The task that remained was to arm it. A nuclear-powered submarine, speeding undetected beneath the surface, was the perfect vessel to fight submarine warfare the way Dernitz envisioned it. A submarine like the Nautilus could torpedo shipping, attack enemy fleets, and even dispose of enemy submarines. But the most troubling threat in the 1950s was not conventional war. It was nuclear war. To be an ultimate weapon, the submarine had to deliver a nuclear blow on land. In the minds of American leaders in the 1950s, that meant hitting inland Soviet cities like Moscow. And the only way that was possible was with a missile. The fundamentals of surface-to-surface -surface missile technology were developed by the Germans for attacks against England during the Second World War. They established two basic types. The V-1 was a kind of cruise missile. It flew like a pilotless jet aircraft. It had wings and a jet engine which powered it towards the target. The V-1's range was limited and it carried only a moderate-sized warhead. But the missile was deadly nonetheless. The other type was the enormous V-2, a ballistic missile. The V-2 was powered by liquid-fueled rocket engines, which thrust it skyward, burned out, then allowed the warhead to fall to its target. The location of the target was determined on the ground. Then two gyroscopes governed the flight of the missile while the engines burned. These gyroscopes sensed any deviation from the correct path and adjusted the missile's course by moving fins beneath the rocket's exhaust, thereby directing the thrust of the engine. The V-2 had greater range than the V-1 and was impossible to shoot down. Armed with a conventional warhead, it wreaked havoc in England and foreshadowed a terrifying new era of warfare. The American Navy was intrigued with the combination of a missile's range and a submarine's stealth. Using knowledge gleaned from German scientists after the war, they began experimenting with submarine-launched missiles in the early 1950s. Ballistic missiles were impossibly large. Most were more than 10 feet taller than the diameter of the largest submarine. So the Navy developed a V-1-type cruise missile called Regulus. But the range of Regulus was only a few hundred miles, not far enough to hit an inland Russian city. Like a plane, Regulus could be shot down, and the submarine launching Regulus had to surface and reveal itself before firing, eliminating the advantage of its stealth. The future of submarine-launched missiles appeared limited. But in 1955, Admiral Arleigh Burke was appointed Chief of Naval Operations. Burke, a commander of destroyers in the Pacific during World War II, was convinced it was possible for American submarines to launch a missile that could strike inside the Soviet Union. He believed a nuclear-armed ballistic missile could transform the submarine into a strategic weapon, a war-decisive weapon that would deter the Soviet Union or any other nation from attacking the United States. For this task, he created an office called Special Projects, and he selected a Navy pilot who had never served on a submarine and had no technical training in missiles to run it. Admiral William F. Rayburn.
In defending his selection, Burke said of Rayburn, I selected him because he has the driving ability. He's got a lot of energy. He's full of enthusiasm, and he can persuade people. He can get things done. He was a man who would appreciate other people's capabilities. Rayburn chose his team and set to work. At first, the task was so daunting that one officer joked, it looks like it might be easier to leave the missile and launch the submarine. To stimulate his men, Rayburn encouraged them to base their work not on what was currently possible, but what would be possible in 10 years when the project was scheduled for completion. Nonetheless, Rayburn faced two immediate and significant problems. Compact solid fuel for the missiles had to be developed. Liquid fuel was too dangerous and too bulky to be carried in a submarine. And a way had to be found to reduce the size of nuclear warheads that required enormous rockets to power them to their targets. In 1956, members of Rayburn's team gathered with a group of scientists at Woods Hole, Massachusetts to study the problems. There, Edward Teller informed them that smaller nuclear warheads would soon be available. Word also reached the group that compact solid fuels would be coming along. The basic designs of the submarine and missile were drawn up within weeks. Rayburn called the system Polaris. Polaris submarines would store 16 missiles in vertical tubes. A blast of compressed air would drive each missile to the surface, where the solid fuel would ignite and the missile take off for its target. The project had taken a giant leap forward. But on August 3, 1957, the Soviet Union announced they had launched the first intercontinental ballistic missile. Two months later, they put Sputnik, the first satellite, into orbit. And suddenly, all American technology seemed out of date. President Eisenhower appeared on television to calm public fears about attacks from space. But while he soothed the public, Eisenhower prodded the military. With the Soviets seemingly ahead of the U.S. in the missile race, America's weapons programs had to be hurried. Three weeks after the Sputnik launch, the 10-year plan for Polaris was scrapped. Burke and Rayburn proposed getting the first submarine to sea by 1960, five years earlier than originally planned. To reach this goal, a Polaris submarine would have to be built in two years. Engineers at the electric boat company didn't believe that was possible. But Rayburn found a brilliant solution. The USS Scorpion, a submarine already under construction, was split in half and lengthened. A section of 130 feet was added to house the two rows of missile tubes and the missile control and navigation equipment. A mere two months after the Sputnik launch, funds were approved and work on the submarine, renamed the George Washington, was underway. Rayburn's team then forged ahead with missile testing. Operation Pea Shooter puts a Polaris test vehicle in the air. At first, dummy slugs check out the ballistic missile launching gear at ground station. Launching gear simulates the motion of a ship as tests move on to the firing stage. First from the land, and then from the sea. Polaris, 28 feet of intermediate range, submarine-based deterrent, soars to a new high in the concept of national defense. In the fall of 1959, under tight security, workers prepared the George Washington for commissioning and testing. Rayburn and his team were on the brink of an accomplishment matched only by the development of the atomic bomb. But at the commissioning on December 30th, 1959, a mood of unusual solemnity filled the air. The 16 Polaris missiles within the George Washington would carry more destructive power than all the bombs that had been dropped in World War II. The men who created this ship and those who would run it 
faced a grave responsibility. Let us pray. Eternal God, whose dominion spreads from pole to pole, who governs the heavens above and the waters below, hear our prayers and bestow your blessings on this submarine, George Washington. Guide and protect the crew of this ship, engaged in the protection of our country and the defense of our liberties. Thus advance your cause, almighty God, in which we of the United States Navy are united, that men throughout the world may have a greater measure of freedom and peace than they now enjoy. On July 20th, 1960, the George Washington put to sea off the Florida coast for the first test of a submarine-launched Polaris missile. Two days earlier, electrical problems had postponed the launch. Captain James Osborne commanded the ship. Admiral Raven was also on board, and Osborne wanted this launch to go perfectly. At 12.39, the final countdown began. Polaris, from out of the deep to target, perfect, was the ecstatic message Rayburn cabled to the White House. Polaris was a triumph. Six months later, Admiral Burke sat in the halls of Congress listening to John Kennedy make his first State of the Union address. In his campaign for president, Kennedy had promised to close the missile gap with the Soviet Union. He spoke now of the need for a strong national defense. He singled out only one weapon by name. I've directed prompt action to step up our Polaris submarine program. We'll build and place on station at least nine months earlier than planned substantially more units of a crucial deterrent. A fleet that will never attack first, but possess sufficient powers of retaliation concealed beneath the sea to discourage any aggressor from launching an attack upon our security. In 1947, American submarines had been declared obsolete. Less than 15 years later, the Polaris submarine was an instrument of presidential power an ultimate weapon which could stare down hostile nations. The submarine had come of age. The years since the Polaris submarines first sailed have seen a proliferation of American and Soviet ballistic missile submarines. Unlike fixed missile silos that can be targeted and long-range bombers that can be shot down, the submarine is an elusive nuclear threat. The best way to keep the submarine threat in check is to know where it is. And the best way to find a submarine is with another submarine. So an elaborate cat and mouse game has evolved in which submarines prowl the seas in search of one another. Between them, Soviet and American submarines alone have enough nuclear armament to destroy the Earth. Fifty years after Churchill declared that the only thing that frightened him was the U-boat peril, the submarine is more terrifying than ever. 